So my name is Jim Ray, and I represent Retro Innovations. Um, I manufacture classic um, computer peripherals. A number of you probably own products or have seen my table here at BCF in the West. Um, one of the things I was going to talk to, most time I come in here and I talk about a, uh, a new feature or a new capability that I've got that, I've, um, that I'm planning to introduce or have to introduce to the show or before the show. Today what I was going to do is, I have a number of people that come over and they ask questions about <clears throat> the idea of manufacturing, uh, the idea of, of putting things together and getting them from an idea um, to an actual uh, uh, produced and manufactured item. And so today I was going to kind of talk through that. I'm also, um, at the appropriate points of the, of the presentation, <clears throat> I was going to talk to you about some of the items that I've um, recently introduced in the marketplace. And so obviously if you have questions, I'll focus on some time at the end of the presentation for questions. So if you could hold your questions to the end, I'd appreciate it. Um, but I do invite anybody to ask me questions about the whole process. So I want to start out with a quote. Um, this is from Nolan Bushnell. Um, folks should know who he is, um, of Atari fame. And uh, the reason I bring it up is at the shows especially, I get an opportunity to talk to a lot of people. And I have a number of people that well, if there's a chair next to me, they'll sit down and they'll say, Jim, I have got a great idea. Right? I mean, they just it's their greatest feat. Is that they join. And they said, oh, man, I bet you just need somebody to come up with ideas. And I hate to tell them right then, no, I have plenty of my own. Right? The problem is turning ideas into reality is what takes all the time. I could come up with 50 million ideas, but it only, you know, only a few of them that can make their way out of idea phase into an actual product phase. And so I just want to tell you guys, um, it's great to have ideas, it's great to come by and say, hey, have you thought about this or whatnot, but for those folks that want to sit down and say, hey, I know you just need somebody to come up with ideas and I'm your man, and say, thank you, but, but no thanks. <clears throat> so if you've got this great idea, the first question that I ask myself, and for anybody that comes over and says, how do you decide what to go forward with or not, the first question I ask them is, um, are you passionate about it? Because I'll be honest with you, everything that I've brought to market thus far, has been an exercise of frustration at certain points of time in the development of the product, right? And if you're not passionate about it, namely if it's not something you are going to use directly or that you have a distinct interest in, it won't get finished. And so I would say any product that somebody comes in and says, hey, um, I think you should build a, like there are a lot of people say, hey, Jim, you should build a lot of stuff for the Amiga. It's a great big market, you should build a lot of stuff for the Amiga. Well, I don't use the Amiga right now. I may in the future, but right now I'm not an Amiga user. So if I build it, I wouldn't use it. And so that's a real problem because if I've got limited time, I'm going to focus my time on things that I probably will spend more time using. <coughs> um, the question I, I ask myself is sometimes is do you have the resources to make it happen? And I, you know, as part of this is I, I want to tell everybody how easy and sometimes a little hard it is to bring a product to market. So if anybody's interested, it's probably the easiest now that it's ever been. In, in the world to bring, to turn ideas into reality, right? The whole idea of the maker spaces, the whole idea of uh, send your stuff on the internet to somebody in China, they'll produce it for you and ship it back to you. You don't even have to leave your house in order to get a product actually made. It's way easier than it was when I was in, uh, in college in 1993. I graduated from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and producing a product, because I did produce one when I was in college, was I mean, you had to run around and do all kinds of stuff. Um, you had to have somebody take care of all the hardware design. You had to have somebody take care of helping you with the software design. You had to have places to take care of um, sourcing your, your uh, uh, chips and integrate certain and whatnot. And the numbers were astronomical. Thousands and thousands of dollars that were required in order to bring, bring this product to market. Now it's much cheaper. But there's still resources necessary. A little bit of cash is, no, is, is, not, uh, is not out of the realm of, of necessity. The other thing is, if it's a hardware product, if you're not going to develop the hardware, who is? If it's a software product, if you're not going to do the software development, who is, right? You can't turn an idea in reality, into reality if you don't have the people necessary. And at the end, I said, it doesn't have to be a one-man show, but it does help, right? So the more you can do yourself, the more controlled the situation is and the, and the easier is to bring the product to market. And the final thing I just want to point out is um, everybody has an opinion and especially at shows like this they are 
they feel very much compelled to let you know what those, what those opinions are. And some of them are really nice, like, hey, thanks for doing this, really appreciate it. When I've had people sit down and go, well, you know, I don't know why you're doing this. You could be spending your time doing so many more important things. Like, well, thank you for telling me what I need to do in my life. But <clears throat> so if you don't have a thick skin, if, if you if, do, you have a thick skin because if you if you don't, you need to find one. So I'm going to focus my discussion today primarily around hardware design, but the principles hold true for software design as well. So I don't want to give short change to the software side, but that's not my primary focus. Um, this is the crappy prototype, and I would say it needs to be the crappy prototype. If you don't make it look like this, you're doing too much work, right? The idea is to fail fast. So if you've got an idea for something and you want to turn it into reality, that white thing in the bottom there is a breadboard, buy one. They are horrible, right? The electrical impedance and everything, that, they're terrible. But you know what? They'll probably do fine for most of your design. And I said, basically, if it barely works, like if you blow on it, it fails, or if you twist it slightly, it fails, that's OK. Right? That's OK. So, so don't get all caught up in that. <clears throat> and if you spent a whole bunch of time looking at data sheets, making sure that you haven't gotten in the, in the forbidden spots in the, suits, in the duty cycles, and your clock signals are all clean and whatnot, you've spent way too much time on your prototype, right? You should quit doing that. Um, and my feeling is, uh, don't try to load up features right initially. If you're working on something, what is the one most important thing that this hardware design needs to do? That's what the prototype should, the prototype should do. If it doesn't do that, then you still need to work on it. If it does that, you're done. The prototype works. You're good. This is the second attempt, and I'm going to show you this actual board. I'm going to send it around. So this is this is the second attempt. I don't know if um, Eric Kudzen's in. Yeah, there he is, right there. So. This is where I say resources, so that's a lot of wires, right? A ton of wires. I was like, oh man, that looks like a lot of work. Hey, Eric, you want to help me out? So Eric sitting right over there was the nice guy who I said, I think I'll give you something, help me make this happen. So this is a MIDI cartridge. I'm going to send it around so you can look at it. This is a little bit nicer looking, right? A little bit easier to, um, uh, to deal with, and it works, right? It plays by more of the rules. Um, this is where a lot of people may stop, right? That's okay, right? You actually made it work. It's actually a real thing. It's no longer an idea. It's an actual, I mean, somebody, you could, there's a tangible item there. You could take it to a show. You can show people what it does. You can demo it, whatnot. <clears throat> At this point, this is where a lot of people make a, a lot of people make a decision as to which way they're going to go, right? So many of you have probably seen the matrix. This is where I kind of call it the blue pill and the red pill, right? Blue pill. You know, you're done, right? You take it to a show, you show it off, you, um, you know, you, you take all the accolades for the prototype that you build, people marvel at it, they take pictures on the, on the table, you lay it out there and you say, this is what I made, it's my child, be happy with it. Um, <clears throat> you yell and scream at all the people who complain that they're not going to be able to buy it. You know, well, aren't you going to make it a product? Nope, that's it, that's done, that's all there is. Enjoy it, move on. Um, or, you can move on to the next step, take the red pill, and see how far the rabbit hole, rabbit hole really goes. And so I'm going to go on to the next step here, which is part of that effort. Um, the next thing that I do, and I would encourage everybody who's interested in, in putting a, uh, a unit together, um, is, to, is to work out the plan. Right? And I'm not saying this is a big formal document like a business plan or a charter or whatever. The focus is, what's this thing going to look like at the end? right? What is it? Is it if it's software? What's the screen going to look like? Or at least what's the idea of a screen going to look like? If it's hardware, is it going to be something that sits inside the machine like this unit right here? Um, or is it going to be something that is a cartridge that sits in the back? Probably the most important two questions to ask is how much do people think, or how much do you think people are going to pay for it? And you know what? Be honest, right? If you were to walk into a show and somebody had the unit that you're thinking about sitting on the, on the table, how much would you pay for it, right? If you're only going to pay, I found in the 10 years that I've been doing this, actually 12 years now that I've been doing this work, all of you out there, if it's $50 to $100, it's like you guys have discretionary cash, right? You just lay that money down. In fact, when I first did one of my first projects, people would just lay money on the table, walk away, and I wasn't even there. Right? I would come back and I'd say, what's the money? And they oh, like, somebody said they wanted a micro IC. And so I said, well, who are they? Right? I mean, money's just sitting on the table. So gets above $100, then everybody starts, oh, man, that's it's cutting into my 
you know, that's cutting into my Starbucks or whatever, right? <laughs> um, how many do you think you're going to be able to sell, right? Um, now, I have underestimated this many times, so thank you very much, right? I, I figured the worldwide market for small SD-based card disk drives were maybe 100 units, and so far I think I've sold 900 or 1,000 of them, right? So, and, and maybe even more than that. I kept, I quit, I quit, I just, I quit uh, counting on the numbers. I'm just like, yeah, I get low on stock, and I call up a place, and I say, I need another 100. Ship them to me when you're done. So that's nuts, right? Um, but on the other hand, you know, don't make, don't make three, don't think there's 3,000 people that are going to buy some special widget. That, you know, like, a, for instance, on the Commodore, on the pet line, there's a super, oh, super, um, super pet, right? And so there's an add-on card that you can use for the super pet to allow it to run OS 9. What do you think the worldwide market for that is, right? I made 25 boards. I think I have like 15 of them left, right? And that's okay. I, not too far off the mark. I can eat that extra cost. And eventually I'll sell them. But don't be thinking there's 100 or 300 people that are going to need that. Um, and then one of the things that I always, I always think about is who's going to buy the product and why? I do know there are people in the marketplace <clears throat> who buy one of everything just so they can say they have it, right? They have no intention of using it. They have no intention of taking it out of the package. I have no idea why they buy it, but they always buy it. <laughs> and, and it. And it doesn't matter how much it costs, right? And the guy who told me that, and I've proven it to be true, but um, I can't think of his last name. Gideon, um, the guy that does Zoe the Ultimate. Huh? Zoeger? Yeah, Zoe yeah. Schweitzer? Or <laughs> it's like Schweitzer. I can't, I'm, I'm right. screwing up his name, and it's videotaped now, so he's going to hate me. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> went um, too. he was sourcing cables for me for his project for quite a while, and I said, man, your unit's like $300, right? And he goes, yeah, it doesn't matter. I got people that buy it just because they got to have it. They got to have it, they got to sit on their shelf, they got to have the unit. So there's, there's some of those people, there's a lot of people who use the unit for something actual, and the key to finding a unit that's going to have wide adoption is if you can tie it into games or music, right? Those are two big drivers. If it plays games or allows somebody to play a game easier or makes a game more playable, that's great. That'll drive that that'll drive, that'll drive adoption. Um, and if uh, it has something to do with music, right, that's a big adoption too. People love the chip tunes. They love the '80s sound, and so anything that helps in that area is great. <clears throat> so I would say at the bottom here, I started to put little lines at the bottom here just to give a key takeaway. And my takeaway is it's better to underestimate than overestimate. Right? If you figure the worldwide market for your unit is 200 units, you make 200 units and you sell 700, good for you. If you think the worldwide market is 700 units and you sell 200, that's bad. That's really bad. <laughs> You're going to sit on those forever. <clears throat> These are the things that I'm, I think about when I put a product together, feature list, um, schematic and PCB layout, uh, software as user interface, expected functionality. I'll talk about some of these other ones like awareness, cost, funding. Um, one of the things I want to point out, uh, kit versus finished product for, uh, for hardware products. Um, one that, and I'm telling you these are the things you should do, and I'm going to tell you there's one of them that I suck at, which is documentation. I do a terrible job of documentation. You can hate on me all you want. Um, marketing and sales. Don't go to, if you, if you want to do something like this and you're thinking, oh, I need to go to a marketing class. I need to go to a, you know, I need to understand how to do sales to people. Understand this community is not like most communities. So, if you go to the handy dandy marketing class, like you're in a multi level marketing group or whatever, that will not work here. <laughs> One of the things I hear a lot about in people putting products together is they have this great product, but it's incompatible with everything, all the software that's out there. Okay? And that really challenges the community adoption. If you don't make it compatible, or at least nominally compatible with the product line, the products that are already out there, um, it's going to be very hard for people to pick up your product and start using it. So like um, for um, the small solid state disk drives, right? The idea is to make it compatible. You don't have to run some, write some or run some special program on the Commodore or on the Coco or on the TI or the Atari to load software off of the SD card. You want to be able to just emulate the disk drive, or emulate the disk If it's a serial card, you want to be able to emulate the serial cards that were, that were prevalent or uh, most common in at the time that the machine was available. Um, it's an easy way to get access to a whole bunch of software that works with your with your system already without having to develop it yourself. Because developing software is tough, 
And then it's not like you can go into this marketplace and say, hey, I got this great new product and I want you all to update all the software that's ever been written to work with my piece of, my piece of hardware, because it's not going to happen. <clears throat> the other thing that I try to do a lot of is put field upgradeability into the unit. So nothing's worse than having a new feature and then having to have everybody ship their unit back to you so that you can update it, right? So the idea is for things like Easy Flash, for things like Micro A CSD, um, or Zoom Floppy, the idea is people can people can update those systems um, where where they are. You know, they don't have to they don't have to ship them back to me. Um, ease of installation, kind of self-explanatory ease of use. Big one is creeping featureitis. A lot of people call it creeping creatureitis, right? Um, it's terrible because. People, they, they pile on when they see a new piece of hardware made for a classic machine, and so they want, they want all, every feature known to man to be in there. Of course, they don't want to pay any more money, right? So they want everything in there, and they want it to be $20. And I'm like, well, you can either have $20, or you can have all the features. And even at that, there's no way to put all those features in to a unit. You'll never finish it, right? So you got to avoid that. Um, one other thing I wanted to say is, um, Try to focus on the features that will build you. <clears throat> so there's a great community around all the different classic machines. And so if you can put a 20, you can do the 20% of the work to generate the 80% of the benefit for the larger portion of the community, that's going to help you out as far as hardware manufacturing. That's what I've done. So you see some products that I haven't brought to market and some things that I just am not spending a lot of time on. It's just because the community just isn't there for that. That's the really your, your biggest bet on getting adoption is <clears throat> so now, for those folks who say, okay, great, that's all great, whatnot, but I, now I really want to get to building a product. The first thing you need to do if you're going to do hardware design is you need to, if you're going to do the hardware design yourself, you need to, <clears throat> um, you need to learn how to do schematic capture and PCB. The two main products, there's a ton of products on the marketplace, the two main products that are used in the hobbyist community and, and whatnot are Eagle and KiCat. Um, there's a couple other GEDA and whatnot, but these are the two that get the most traction. Um, KiCat is free, so it's obviously a good choice. Eagle has got a free version for those folks who are not going commercial, but if you're in this boat and you're working to come up with a design, you're probably going to want to sell it, and so you got to spend a little money to, to get Eagle. I use Eagle. Um, I started using it. There's a lot of parts libraries out there from companies like SparkFun and whatnot that are um, uh, that are <coughs> that are based on you know built using the Eagle system, and so I just I've gotten very um, I've gotten very uh, <coughs> adept at using Eagle, and so that's the package I use. But KiCad is fine as well. Um, enclosure options: if it's not going the unit's not gonna fit inside the machine, um, you know how are you going to how are you gonna keep dust off the unit? Now for the some of the lines, people sell reproduction cartridge cases. That's great. Um, other things I know there's. I, I saw him. Or, uh, there you are. Um, <clears throat> 3D printing, John, right? Yeah. Um, 3D printing for cases and whatnot. Those are options as well. Um, but you know, what? What you, if you're not going to design a case and build a case? What do people? What do you want people to buy to put the equipment in? And then, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things to point out is there's a, in this community there is a I would say. Uh, a, a camp of individuals who want the units as kits. So they want to have the satisfaction of building the unit themselves. Um, but if it is a kit, they need to make sure that's enough place. Most people that are building the kits are over 40 years old, right? And so their eye, their, you know, their eyes aren't what they used to be, and their dexterity may not be what it used to be when they're 20, so you've got to make sure that you plan for that when you put the board together, or else it'll just be endless frustration putting the system together. Um, a lot of people want to focus on everything being right the first time, right? And that's going to be, you're going to mess yourself up if you do that. Typically, these designs go through a couple iterations. Um, nowadays, it's not, it's not horrible to go through a couple harder iterations. Um, I'll talk a little later and when I talk about resources, but it is cheaper than ever before to, um, cheaper than ever before to get printed circuit boards done at a cheap, a cheap uh, uh, cost. Used to be it was, um, you know, probably hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars to do a printed circuit board run. Now you can do a board run of ten for fifty bucks, right? So that's not that big a deal. 
Here's one thing that a lot of people get caught up in, awareness, right? So I come to the show and I get two kinds of people. I get, a, I get one group person that says, oh my goodness, I didn't know that you were working on this. Why didn't you tell us earlier? I get another group of people that says, well, you know, are you sure you should have told me yet about this? Because now, you know, now, the, now the community is going to pile on and want a whole bunch of stuff. So there's pros and cons to each side. A lot of people will go into the forums or whatnot, and they'll, as soon as they have their idea and they put it on prototype version or put it on a board, they'll announce that they're going to do it. I'm going to build this unit or whatnot. The challenge with that is, every, like I said, everybody piles on and wants new features added, right? The other one is you have a whole bunch of people in the community, especially in the forums, even the ones that are handled very nicely, but everybody gets to be an armchair designer, right? Everybody has an idea for what should be done differently. The board should be longer, the board should be shorter, the board should be blue, the board should be white, the board should have this, the board should have that. Don't bother with this piece, don't bother with that. Um, it can create a lot of noise as you're trying to figure out how to move your product, remove your idea into a product or manufacturing capability, it can create a lot of noise for you. Um, and the other one is if you engage in these discussions and you say, well, no, I don't really think it needs to do that, then you can get in this big flame war and this big argument online, which just sucks up more time. Um, but there is value to um, telling people earlier rather than later because people in the midst of all that noise, there are times where there's actual good information. Like, oh, hey, did you remember that such and such a place, they used to build a cartridge that did that and it had this cool feature and it would be really neat if you had that cool feature and you're like, oh, well, yeah, I didn't know that and I could add value to, the, to my design by putting that capability in. Um, telling people late has its own advantage. You don't have to deal with the flame war. You don't have to deal with the endless criticism of your design or whatnot. The problem is, you got when you show up at the show and you don't have any, and you, the unit's there for the first time, people are just learning about it. They're not going to buy it because they don't know what it does. They don't, haven't decided where they want to buy it or not. They don't decide if they're interested in it or not. So there's a time when it can be too late and there's a time it can be too early. Um, so my goal is to create awareness when there's still time to tweak, but after you're pretty sure of what the product's going to do, right? If I'm working on a flash cartridge and somebody says, hey, wouldn't it be great if it had a video chip on it? And I'm like, mm, no, thanks. I mean, maybe I'll do that another thing, but not right now. I'm, this is just a memory expansion. It's not going to do six things. It's just going to do one. But if you've got a small tweak, I'm happy to hear about it, right? The other one is you can tell people, especially now I've been in the market for 12 years, and so people I have a good track record of if I say I'm going to bring it to market, chances are I'm going to get it to market. And so they're pretty sure that, hey, I can be interested in this and excited about it because it's going to actually show up in Jim's store at some point for sale. <clears throat> I didn't put a whole lot on software design. It's not my big thing. I'm sure there's tons of people that could talk about but don't forget about it, right? Um, I got a situation we were just talking before. Uh, I came in here to give this presentation. I've got a product in the marketplace right now and I, it, it, the product is fine but people are struggling to use the product because the software for it is hard to use, right? And so that's detracting a lot from the ability. People want the software to be, they're not asking for it to have graphical windows and mouse and stuff like that, but they do need it to be reasonable to be able to load software on or to be able to get it to do what they want it to do. And so now I've, I'm talking to some folks here at the show, which is a great networking opportunity about, hey, can you help me out about building some better software? Um, uh, you know, builders, build, building better software so that uh, the unit will be more accepted in the marketplace. So software can make or break a hardware project. And if it's software only, then it's the only thing you have. If it doesn't work, nobody's going to use it. Um, I see a lot of people when they do uh, software design, they want to make it Windowsy, right? Or Mac os -y or whatever you want to call it, right? I'm, I, if, you're, if that's your goal in the piece of software, that's fine. But I don't think every application needs a mouse library and a user interface and drop down windows and whatnot. That wasn't something that was all that common in previous eras and so I think it's better to align with whatever era the system was in. If it was an 80 column, uh, 25 line screen and you check, you did number or letters, you know, pick A for this work and B for that work, that's probably the alignment you want on your user interface. Um, a lot of people will build pieces of software and they'll want to make sure that all the features are implemented, which translated it into all the features work badly, right? Or they don't work at all. So I think it's better to put a thing that says, you know what? It does these three things and it does them pretty well. I'll add more. I mean, software is easy to distribute now. Easier than it's ever been to distribute new versions of software. You just go ahead and lay it down. I'll, I'll get it later. Um, easier than it's ever been to do software distribution. So don't sweat trying to get all the things 
in the software right up front. So I haven't been talking about stuff on the side. I'm going to talk about it. I may go back and show you some of the other ones. But this is a, um, this is a new product that I'm working to bring to market. It's a uh, RS-232 interface for the Coco. So I have one for the, um, for the Commodore 64 and a design that other people sell. And this one's one for the Coco I'm going to sell. This one has the advantage of running at 230K um, as opposed to just 19.2, which I think was the maximum for, for color computers. Uh, the the RS-232 RS pack for the color computer. But that's a board that I'm working on. It's out. You can see it uh, in my, uh, on my tables. Um, cost is a big deal as I get working on this. There's a lot of hidden cost in bringing something to market. Even though things are cheap individually, there's still stuff that you need to factor in. Um, I'm not going to go through all the list because it's pretty self-explanatory. But the bottom is kind of important. So. I had a person come up to me, probably not recently, hopefully they got the note, but I had a person come up probably five years ago and he says, oh Jim, I'm so glad that you do this stuff for us, but you, you need to charge more because you are not making any money on this unit and you are going to get burnt out and you're not, I mean, th the sentiment is great. I didn't really have the heart to tell him that, uh, yeah, I already doubled and tripled the cost of whatever this is before I put it on the market because I'm not doing my work for free, right? Um, so I've already built that in, but some people don't. I, I know a couple years ago, a guy was here working on a design, and I said, wow, that's a lot of stuff on that. And he says, yeah, it cost me $95 to make the board, and he's selling it for $110, right? So he's, he's making, what, 15 bucks spread on that board. And now, I, I resisted the urge initially to say, that's, you could do that board for much cheaper than $95. But you know, whatever, it is what it is. He, he sourced the parts himself. He was hand, hand assembling the boards. Um, and you know that's that's how much it costs to put him to put the board together. But he's not making enough spread for himself, you know. And these things get to be boring to put together at times, or to get them the sales done or whatever. I mean, you got to have something in there to say, there's an incentive for me to get the units out the door and to make the make the purchases or make the sales happen. Um, so my main takeaway on this is, if you decide to move a product from idea to production, put your put your dollars in there. Make sure you're paying yourself something tangible to make it worth your while to put this stuff out there. <clears throat> so I forgot to check the exact name for this, but how many people saw the, um, the fiasco earlier this year about the, I think it was called the Coco Chameleon? Is that, was that what it was called? The, do I have the name right? Chameleon. The Coleco Chameleon, that's right, the Coleco Chameleon, sorry. I had Coco on the mind. Um, so that was a crowdfunding thing, started out, ended up like an NES on a chip in a Saturn case at the toy show. I mean, it was, it was horrible, right? I won't go into all the details, but um, I, I would add, I invite everybody to be a little wary of doing the GoFundMes and the Kickstarter, or not, yeah, the Kickstarters and those, kind of, of show, uh, those kinds of um, funding options because um, this market, I think, has gotten to the point where there's been enough of the uh, failures that people are starting to get very skeptical of putting their money out there if there's no reasonable guarantee that there's going to be a product that's going to materialize at the end of it, you know. Especially in light of the fact that I see a lot of these things and I wonder, do you really need $17,000 to bring something? I mean, it, that's a lot of money, right? 34, 40, 80, whatever the dollars are, that's a lot of money to bring a product to market. And um, sometimes it's worth it, but a lot of times I wonder if a lot of that money is just kind of getting stowed away and doesn't actually make it into the product itself. Um, prepayments are another concern. I know a number of people be on, been on forums and they've said, hey, I want to build this and I need you all to, to fork over $100 and we'll start production, right? It's possible. I'm not going to say either one of these options are not, not something that you can pursue, but um, I, I'm a little wary of them because that's how reputations get really damaged. And I know it's not in here in a slide, but I just want to voice over that now, even more than ever, there's a significant risk to not delivering on your promises because forum content lasts forever, right? I know in the Commodore arena, there's an individual who um, was selling products and then was unable to continue to sell um, products for a number of years, and the, and the forums just continue to, to yell about it and complain about it, and, may, and, and there's upset people. And, and rightly so, they may be upset, they may have legitimate gripes, but that forum posting is there forever. 
And so your reputation could get tarnished so easily and it's very hard to get back once you've had all that happen. It's much easier to, to significantly under-promise and, and, uh, than, to, than to go into that area. And so prepayments are a big concern. If you're not absolutely sure that you can bring the product to market, I'd be leery of taking people's money. Like I said at the bottom here, everybody's excited and it's all fun and games until, people change, until money changes hands. And then people get, there's some people they, that's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? As soon as they, soon as you got their money, they are very upset. If anything, any delays happen, if it's going to cost any more money, or if it looks like it might not materialize, they'll be the first one on the forum or the first one in the show to be yelling at you. Parts. So, I my goal is to bring products to market as inexpensively as as possible, but not cut corners, right? And so these are some of the things I look on. Digikey, Mouser, to a lesser extent, Allied are the places that I source parts from. Um, one time I thought I'd save a little money. I have a, out there for the Commodore, Commodore environment, I have a micro, uh, like an SD based uh, uh, drive, right? It's, a, it's a, like a Commodore 1541 type drive, but it's got a flash storage. <clears throat> and it has a single chip microcontroller on the back of it. And I work with a supplier, uh, an assembly plant overseas, and they said, hey, we have somebody in China that can supply this CPU if you want to pursue that. I'm like, sure, because it was like 20 or 30% cheaper. I'm like, great. Got the parts, half of them failed. Half of them were counterfeit. Now, luckily, the assembly, the place that sold the parts to my assembler made good on the supply. He said, I'll give you another, it was a batch of 100, and so he said, I'll give you another 50 chips from a reputable source that I know is correct parts, but I still had to solder them on. And they were, they were a 64 pin part, surface mount. Now, well, how many hours I spent doing that? So that's not happening, right? <clears throat> the place I assemble with overseas, they buy their parts from DigiKey. So think about this for a minute. The parts are actually manufactured in Asia. Then they ship on a big boat over to Thief River Falls, Minnesota, which is where DigiKey is, to which the company in China that I work with buys them, so which they ship these parts all the way back to China to manufacture the unit. I don't know how, I don't know, but whatever, right? I don't even try to think about that much. But that's what actually happens, and it works out pretty well. So this unit right here on the, le on the right, sorry, is uh, it's an, it's a product that I'm bringing to market on the Coco. It's called the Coco Flash. It has 8 meg of uh, flash storage, so you can store cartridges in it. And then the new feature that's on the right-hand corner of the unit up the top is um, for the color computer, there's a, a cartridge that people have had for a number of years called the Orchestra 90 cartridge. And so I've, I've, I've uh, built the Orchestra 90 capabilities into the right-hand side of the cartridge. So you see all those little resistors and stuff there up the top? That's the sound generation uh, capabilities of the Orchestra 90. And then, of course, the other part of the Orchestra 90 was the ROM, and that can be stored in Cocoa Flash. So this is a unit, and I also have it out on the table. <coughs> um, so. Focus on those. DigiKey always has the part, no matter when you, I mean, it might be back ordered, but they're going to get it, right? So if you, if you spec those parts, they'll be available. You can order them from there. eBay is a dicey deal, okay? I'm not going to say don't do it. I use it on occasion. There's a lot of good surplus products. People go out of business and they have a big reel of something and, and you know, it's available on eBay and, you know, that's a possibility, if, but you got to check them out. They might be counterfeit um, if they're, if they could be really cheap, but they could be they could be useless, right? So it's kind of you're you're kind of you're playing the playing the odds if you do eBay. The other one is there's no guarantee that if you source it from eBay today and it's there, that if you go back in six months, there's going to be another stock of it to use. So if your product actually turns out to be useful and somebody says, "Hey, can we do a reorder?" Uh, no, because the main part I need for it, it's not available on eBay right now. Um, I know a lot of people would say, "Well, if eBay is not," something that you should pursue, then China should be totally out, especially since Jim just told this whole story about um, getting parts from China and they were counterfeit. But remember I said pretty much all the parts are made in Asia anyway, right? And so you can actually hook up with those suppliers directly. Um, I don't have it here, but um, I, for, I knew I'd forget something, but I have a Zoom floppy unit, which is a USB-based converter that allows you to hook up uh, IEEE drives, IEEE Commodore drives, which are these big, huge connectors. The people normally see the IEEE connector because it looks a lot like the connectors on back of parallel printers. It's a little bit smaller. It's 24 pins as opposed to 36, but it's a big, huge connector, right? 
Well, I found a source in the US that sold those connectors and they were $9 a connector, $9 a connector, right? Those people, I mean, you'd think they were gold plated for that cost, right? <clears throat> Everything gold plated, not just the pins. Um, found a source overseas that sells them for not quite, probably a fifth of that price, right? So a fifth, like two or three dollars, uh, two dollars or something is what the, what the units cost. And of course the only downside is I have to buy them in batches of 1400, right? And, you, and you're like, oh yeah, right, Jim. You're not, I've used a whole box of them and I've whole order of them and bought another one. So, you know, so I, you, if, you're, if you play your cards right, you can get through there. Um, but it makes a huge difference, $2 versus nine. So you can do China and I source some parts from China. Um, one place that if you're interested in sourcing from China, and I'll put resources up after the presentation, but if you're interested in sourcing small quantities of stuff, there's some places like Alibaba and UT Source and places like that that'll sell you in, in quantities of 100 or 50. You know, and that's not too bad, right? Price is a little higher, but still pretty competitive. Definitely more competitive than the $9 connectors, right? Um, so I wouldn't completely write off China, but you do need to verify the supplier and you need to make sure the products aren't counterfeit. Here's one that a lot of people complain to me about, okay, kit versus finished product. So most, most of my products, in fact, all but maybe two of my products are finished. They're done. Because, and, and this was the fallacy, people sent to me and they say, hey, build a kit. It's cheaper and people will build it and they have a sense of accomplishment when they get it done, right? They'll solder it up and it'll be a total sense of accomplishment and they will revel in that. And you know, they'll just they love you for that and it'll just be better for everybody all around. Well, the reality is nothing like that. Now, I'm not saying don't do kits, right? I'm saying I, you do kits, but don't do, uh, don't do them because you're gonna save money because you don't. More cost for me. I spend more time on the phone or via email trying to fix somebody's kit after they've butchered it, right? Because they don't know how to solder, right? Here's the deal. They, they go online and they're like, oh, I could buy an assembled kit or assembled unit and it's 60 bucks. Oh, that's a lot of money. But there is a kit version and it's only $20. Oh, score for me. I can do $40 worth of soldering. What's a soldering iron? You know, that's the thing, right? And, and they use, you know, there's a soldering iron pencil. You, hopefully everybody knows one. And then there's a soldering gun, right? right. So, you know, I've seen the soldering gun. I mean, I don't even own one, but I know they make them, right? And, you, you, you know, and, they, and I say, okay, well, it's not working, right? Oh, it's not working. I don't know what's wrong. Can you help me? Well, I, you know, I'll try and help. Can you send me a picture? And there must be, there must be 100 pounds of solder <laughs> on, that, on that unit, right? And, and you're like, oh, um, can you get rid of all of that silver stuff so we can actually see the components? Oh, yeah, I guess I can. Let me bring my soldering gun. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Do you have a soldering iron? Yeah, a soldering gun. No, no, you have a pencil? Soldering iron? Oh, uh, no, do I need one? Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, it, it's just been a mess. It's just been a mess. So. Anymore, I really shy away from doing kits because they cost more for me. I spend more time, if I do a finished unit, I know it works out of, the, out of the door. When I ship it out the door, I know it works. So if it doesn't work for you, there's a rare chance it got buggered up in the mail, but most of the time it's you, right? And I can help you over the phone, or I can just ship you a new one. You're like, you know what, forget this. We'll just, sh just ship me that one back and I'll just ship a new one to you. It's easy. I can pop a new one in the mail in the next morning and it's no big deal. If I got to sit down and try to figure out what did you do wrong while you were soldered this thing up, it could take days, right? So I love the idea of kits and I think, you know, that a lot of the folks in the S100 space, they build, they, they have the boards, the kits, and then you're supposed to build, it, build them yourself and that's great. But it's definitely an experience thing. It's not for savings, right? I guarantee, unless you are really good at putting kits together and you know you can do it, you will spend more money putting, you will spend more time and more frustration putting the kit together than you would just buying a finished unit and using it. So be aware of that. Licensing. So I see people spend all their time focusing on putting something together and they don't think about what license to put in. Um, I've made it a philosophy when I started in this business, my goal was to put all of my products that I possibly could under a license that would let other people build them and other people sell them. Because I figure one of these days, um, 
I'm going to have something else like grandkids or great grandkids or whatever. And I'm going to say, you know what? This job, this thing is not important enough to me. I'm going to do this other thing. And so I'm out. And so the problem we have nowadays are all these products that used to be on the marketplace developed by people like me, but they left. And the product has no, either, what do you do? Do you reverse engineer it? Do you, do you try to figure out what it did? Um, some of them are really cool, but they're not available anymore, and there's no way to make any more of them. And so that seems a real shame to me. So I would recommend um, that people choose an open source license. There's a big uh, set of arguments around whether you want the BST, BSD style licenses, or you want the copyleft licenses. When I use copyleft, and I'm happy to explain to you why I do that. I have thought it through. Um, but some people want the BSD, MIT type licenses. That's fine. Just pick something that lets your product outlive your involvement in the community. Um, basically, to, as I said in the bottom, plan on your exit. Right? I realize this may be the only thing you ever bring to market, but plan on your exit. I'm trying to. So when I leave, the products will still live on. Manufacturing. Okay? If you even think about building your own PCBs, come up so I can slap you. Okay? <laughs> Don't do that. Right? I literally bought some on Thursday for 11, 10 PCB boards for 11 bucks. Right? Shipped to my door. It cost twice as much money to ship them to my door than it cost to make them. Right? And I mind you, it's only 10 PCBs, but still, like five days and I had them. I think you can get them in three days if you really want to. Right? If you want to pay a little bit extra to ship them via FedEx, you can be there in three days. They're done. I didn't do anything. I sh zipped up the, the, the artwork from, the pr from Eagle. I put, went onto the website. I uploaded on the website. They said, hey, it's this big. It costs this much money. I PayPal'd them some money. And six days later or five days later, boards show up in my mail. You just cannot. There's, no, there's not worth it. All the noxious chemicals and the drilling the holes and the lining up the photo transfers. And No, just no. Sorry. Just don't do that. OK? Um, if you want to do a couple units hand assembly, uh, Mark Gladson's not in here, is he? So he has the IEEE kind of board here on the right as you come in that, or the, well, you're not coming in the side door, but right by the side door, right next to my booth, is a guy named Mark Gladson, and he has some IEEE VIC 20 boards, some interface boards or whatever. And he has 50 boards, and he's hand assembling. And he came to me yesterday, as last night I was putting the thing together, he said, Never again, never again am I going to hand it, right? One or two, it's fine, right? And that's great. But 50 of them, you know, that's, that's a lot of work, right? And a lot of time. Um, especially given the fact, and here's what it is, it costs a little over a penny and a half per pad to have them assembled professionally. So count up how many pads on your board, multiply it by 0 0.015, that's how many dollars it's going to cost per board. If your time is, worth, is, is that cheap, you really, we need to talk because you are cheap labor and I would love to take advantage of you, right? <laughs> um, I just saw a place the other place called Macrofab, right? I don't know anything about them, so I'm not endorsing them, but they have a thing where you upload your, your artwork and you upload your build materials and you pay them money and out pops finished units, right? You don't even have to source the parts, right? You're just like, oh no, I want you to put these parts on. And they go buy them and they go put them on they don't even have to pass through your house, right? You just, there, that's what I want. And it just shows up. How many days later it is, they just, boards show up and then hopefully they work because you made a good design and there you go, right? Um, I tried to use US firms. I really did. I'm sorry, but I am, can't put the made in USA on my boards. I priced out, since I knew what my little SD flash, uh, SD card driver or drive was, was going for as far as cost is concerned. I sent it to a couple firms in the US and had them source it. For one, they do not have the customer service aspect down for small volumes, right? Because they were asking me, well, we need, a, we need your tax ID and we need, to fill, we need to get you set up an account. And I'm like, can't I just PayPal, right? Can't I, you know, can't, this is how I don't, I don't set up accounts. I'm not big enough to set up accounts. And then they were like, well, you know, who's your purchasing agent? And I'm like, huh? so, um, anyway, and they we got done, and the cost to just do the assembly was like five times more than, than what it was overseas. And the parts were five times more again. And, and it's parts. I could buy the parts myself, and so I didn't understand that at all. So it's not cost effective yet for small volume. U.S. firms are really, they're really either on 
significant expensive prototypes where money's not an option or money's not any object or things where intellectual property is so important that it's no, it's no value to send it overseas or it's, it's got a lot of risk in sending it overseas. Um, I keep checking about every three years I do market analysis to see if it's come down but so far it hasn't. Um, production runs take about 30 business days. So when you say, when I, when I go on the forum and I say, hey, I released it to production, that's starting a timer and 30, day, 30 business days later, right, which is six weeks, because business day, really five weeks, they, Saturday counts, I think, most of the time for them, but definitely five and sometimes six weeks are necessary before, um, uh, before the unit uh, is going to materialize at my house. Um, I said at the bottom, it seems like it's scary, but it's really not. It's really not that big a deal. And there's people like me that have been in the business. You can feel free to send me a note or ask me, like, hey, you know, how can I, how can I get through this? Because it sounds scary to me. Sales and distribution. When I, first did, when I did my first product, um, I posted online saying, hey, I was thinking about making this. And immediately people started saying, can I PayPal you money? You know, it's like, well, I, had, I don't even have a product to sell. That's OK. I'll just PayPal you money. Well, I got overwhelmed very quickly, right? I had all these people who had PayPal me money and I didn't get addresses or I got addresses, but I forgot I got money from them or whatever. And so very quickly in this, and it's really easy to do nowadays, I set up a web store. It's cheesy, it doesn't look very good, but you know, it's there, it takes PayPal, it gives me the people orders, it gives me their addresses. It tells me when I shipped it to them and it tells me when I have it, right? And that's pretty much all I ask for. Um, conference shows, these are great shows to come to, a lot of times to hear about new ideas, Obviously, love for you guys to come by and, you know, um, uh, uh, buy a lot of product, and you do, but only when it's brand new, right? So all of you came by last year and you bought whatever the new thing was last year, but now you have it, so you don't need another one. So now I got to kind of keep coming up with new things. This unit on the right is a uh, RS232 cartridge for the Commodore 64. It's a replacement for the Turbo 232. For those of you who know what a Turbo 232 is. Um, I want to point out that the, these, the community is not a usual customer base, right? He, uh, you're not going to high pressure sales. You're not going to, you know, I, I keep getting things from Google, right? Google says, hey, you look like a business. You should use AdWords. And I'm like, really? I, are you all really into that? So I mean, you're going to see an, an ad on the side of your Google search that says, come buy something from Jim. And you're going to, oh, I need to go do that, right? <clears throat> I just don't think that's going to work. So that's just not helpful for me at all. But they keep thinking it is. So um, I'm going to send around a couple of boards. Don't worry, you can't blow these up. These are prototypes of the early version of the Coco Flash unit. I'll send one or two of them that way and one of them down this way. Um, here we go. So you guys can get an eye of you know, what kinds of things are going on. And then I'm going to send these two boards down. This one is a prototype unit of the Ultimim. This is a 8 meg. ROM 1 meg flash cartridge for the VIC-20 that I designed last fall and put into production in the spring. That's a prototype. And then the unit that's going to hopefully get put down right with it is the production unit. So you can see how they're almost the same, um, just slight differences, a little bit longer uh, design and whatnot. And then just for comparison, I'm going to bring, I'm going to send around, this is an actual production MIDI cartridge for the VIC-20. Um, it's pretty well stuffed and you can see some of the parts that are on it as well as you can see if you look closely one of the mistakes I made on the board. So there you go, you can see that. And so I'm going to, when I get, um, when I assume there'll be a place to put this up. I'm going to put a whole bunch of resources in here, but I'm going to open up for questions. So what questions do people have? Yeah. I was thinking that if I sold a kit, I wouldn't have to pass FCC regulations. But if I sold a finished product, I would have to go FCC and maybe even UL or something. So UL is li typically line uh, voltage, FCC regulations. If you use a unit that is, does not have its own uh, kind of central processing unit, so there are some things that you, you're kind of an appendage to the other machine. So if you're not generating RF, then you don't necessarily have to have that, that level of concern. And that is one, that is one thing, like FCC um, can be an expensive operation. I'll be honest with you, a lot of this stuff in the vintage arena I don't, you know, it's, as long as it stays under Part 97 regulations, you're, you, you know, I, I'd say I'm, I'm pretty confident that we're okay there. Um, but if you want to sidestep that, you know, there's kind of where do you feel comfortable with these type of things. Um, kits are, like I said, it's not insurmountable to do a kit. It's just plan on, plan on lots of time via email, maybe even phone to help people that 
may not, maybe shouldn't have bought your kit in the first place, right? Probably shouldn't have bought your kit in the first place. And the other trick I've seen some people use is they'll have one very simple part or two simple parts, et cetera, on like connectors. Yep. And then they call it a kit. To yeah. Meet that class. That's right. That's, uh, Germany's really kind of comprehensive in that area. So if you manufacture, uh, I know there's another manufacturer of the Easy Flash 3, and when they manufacture it in Germany, they do exactly that. They leave one of the components off and they put it in the bag. And so that way it's still a partially assembled unit, so it's still considered a kit. It works, it's, I don't know, it's a little dicey, but I, I don't have to worry about that particular regulation, but the, if you, that's the reason it's tough to, uh, Germany, it's tough to be a hobbyist manufacturer in, in Germany for that reason. Yeah? You, the bullet there on overseas sales, I'm curious what you to plan for for that. Well, it's just, you see, a lot of pl you see a lot of places on eBay, like a lot of folks might use eBay as their selling mechanism, which is fine. I didn't put it up here, but it's definitely viable. But you see a lot of those places say, ship to US only, right? And no overseas sales and whatnot. Well, I'm telling you, the overseas sales make up a considerable minority of my sales. Even though it costs, you know, a, uh, a priority mail package anywhere in the US is like $6. A priority mail package in Europe is 23, right? So it's significantly more expensive. Um, they've got to pay customs charges, you know, but still they're, they're eager to buy these products and I think you, you minimize or ignore those, those options for sales at your peril, right? Because they can drive a lot of adoption of your product because the U.S. tended to be more of a consumer product marketplace. Even now, people want to take a product and just use it. Europeans are very much into tinkering. So I, I want to take it and I want to see what it can do and I want to write some stuff for it. And wanna, so they're kind of be more hands on and that drives more adoption. Hold on, i give you a new one here. Yeah. Okay, so um, just curious if the, um, if the uh, add one part was a way to skirt like a value added tax or something, so now it's a kit, not a product. Is there perhaps in some way, uh, is it, did you learn some tweets about customs? Did mm -hmm. you know, get, get it cheaper or faster? Yeah, uh, I have not because I haven't went down that path, but um, I can check on that and see if that's, you know, that's a way that, you know, you can kind of uh, change the customs amount. Part of it, customs primarily is driven by, if it's an electronic component, then it's got X number of, you know, value added tax or customs. I don't know that customs really worries so much about whether that's assembled or not. It's just how much it costs. Because I have a lot of people send me notes and say, could you please declare this as $20 instead of 80? Because if it's under 30 or something like that, I don't have to pay customs on it. And if it's over 30, then I gotta pay 52% or something. See, customs is huge. And I get yelled at sometimes because people say, well, I bought your product for $60, but you didn't include VAT or customs. And I'm like, well, it's not, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't do that. And I didn't say on my website that I was gonna include customs. And I don't want to include customs because think about it. If you include customs in your charges, then you've got to make sure you get it to everybody, right? I've got to get Germans customs money to Germany and, and Netherlands and, your, and Canada and all these different places. I don't want to do that. You take care of that on your side and plan on it accordingly. I just wanted to say the stuff you said is very good. Okay. I've experienced some of this in a small scale myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done software for a long time. The 3D case has just started recently, and, and basically I was going to buy it and build some stuff for myself, and I was one of my friends I was doing this. Oh, well, you need to make this. I'll buy one. Uh, okay. You know, I figured maybe I, I sell a dozen, mm -hmm. okay, of a particular case. I've sold well over 100, and maybe on 200. Yep. You know, and I've lost count. Yep. Uh, but, you know, you have to price it, okay? What is it, enough that I can see the interest? 3D cases, I've got to watch. I've got to be basically a lot of time to be there mm -hmm. because they can, they can act up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is my cost? How much time am I going to have for it? Okay? Right. The cost of the plastic is cheap, you know? But the rest of the stuff is the reason they're taking on the price. Okay? Yep. And you got to price, you know, I like to price myself that it's inexpensive. It's right. me, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I got to have enough that I'm going to look at it in a day. I'm not feeling good, but I want to do this. That's right. That's right. And very good comments and stuff. I believe. Yeah, I'm. I'm curious about 
Because um, I've had PCBs made in China. Yep. And and that's been realized. I haven't actually done manufacturing. I did I did one manufacturing board, but it was on something with modern parts that that they sort of had in a, an open parts library kit. So it was really easy to get them to do that. But what I, I don't what I'd like to know is like the flow of getting parts from DigiKey to them. How does that all work? So what I do is when I do, I try not to buy the parts myself. What I'll do is I will send the design, the printed circuit board design to the manufacturer. Typically assemblers do PCB as well. Actually they don't do it, they, but they have somebody, a third party that does the PCB manufacturing for them. So I'll send the, in the, in the parlance, um, the files are called Gerber files, right? Like Gerber baby food, right? Gerber files, although they have nothing in common with each other, but whatever, that's what they're called. And so you send these files over and then you say, you know, can you quote me this? And the other thing I send is a bill of materials. So I say, these are all the things that I need to put on here and here's the, what they are. And you can get that out of the tools, right? Eagle will create that for you. KiCad, I'm sure was well. Um, then they send back a note and say, here's my, you know, here's the invoice. It's going to be, you know, Typically, I do my runs in 100 boards at a time. That seems reasonable, right? 100 boards gives me a little cushion. It's not too many if I don't sell anymore, blah, blah, blah. Um, so 100 units, and let's say the unit costs $10 to make. So that's about, you know, that's, that's kind of on the high end, but somewhere between $500 to $1,000. And they usually take PayPal. So I'll PayPal that money to them. And then they take care of sourcing the parts from DigiKey or Mauser or whoever. They put them in. They put them in their automated assembly tools and whatnot. And the only other thing I give them that makes it a little easier for them, they used to do this on their own, but now I deliver it to them, is what's called a centroid file, which says the part R1 is at 0 0.0052 by 0 0.067, and it's oriented 90 degrees or whatever it is. And if they have that, they just load that into the machine, and it automatically figures out where to do the pick and place, and then it automate it, automatically assembles it. 100 units, 50 units is probably the, the minimum that you'd want to do automated assembly on. I think it gets too expensive after you get below that. But it's a very painless process. The only thing that is challenging is that you've done all this work and it's been really fast, so let's say, you know, comparatively. And then you get done and you pay this money and then it's six weeks, right? That's a month and a half before you're going to actually see a product show up at your door. And so that can get a little bit challenging. Have you, have you ever had trouble with them not being able to source parts or anything like that? Uh, no, because I, typically if DigiKey doesn't have it, Mauser will, and so we'll just get it from Mauser. Um, or there are options to substitute. Um, uh, you know, that it's not like you know if I have to move from one RAM chip to another, most of them will have the same footprint, and so I can probably find a you know a, a replacement product. Do you have to source like in your bill of materials? Do you have like? Do you put the DigiKey number in there? I do. Okay. I do, typically. But at least you use the manufacturer number and then they find it. Yep. One more question, then I'm going to wrap it up. Okay. Um, you were mentioning that you weren't a fan of uh, crowdsourcing options like Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I was wondering how you felt about the idea of just using Kickstarter for pre sales where you've already gone through the prototype phase, you've already built working prototypes, now it's coming to the point of. Well, you need to you know, manufacture that 100 boards. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think Kickstarter is a viable way to say, well, okay, I've already got the product. I'm just trying to, if I raise my goal, that's to pay for the 100 boards. The 100 people that buy it need to get more. I, yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. I don't want to sell crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing sites too short. I, I'm just saying be wary. I'm not saying I'm not a fan of them. I think they have value, especially for what you're describing. If you know you are going to get there, and you just need some cash to get over the hurdle, great. I just see so many of those product projects that are like, well, we think we're going to build this. Give us some money and we'll see if we can make it materialize. And that just worries me. So I appreciate it. You can always talk to me later at the show booth. Um, and uh, I, the information is recorded digitally so you can listen to me, him and haw afterwards. Thank you all very much.